Welcome back to CET 2112C. This is Digital Systems 1, and in this video, we are going to discuss some flip-flop applications. So we're going to look at a couple of new devices, such as the Schmidt trigger device and a one-shot device. We're going to learn how they work. We're also going to look at several applications of different types of flip-flops, including flip-flop synchronization, detecting an input sequence, detecting an edge, and data storage and transfer. So we're going to begin with the figure below, which shows an AND gate connected to a debounce switch. The other input of the AND gate is a clock signal. If we were to make an output waveform for the output of the AND gate, you would see that in the diagram on the right. As the clock transitions, it's going to go into the AND gate with input A. Imagine input A is like a button, maybe to a elevator or a microwave or anything that would require a button where the button could be pressed at any random time. We don't know when the button will be pressed, but we do know that at some point the button will be pressed. That will cause a high to go into the AND gate and the output of the AND gate will be high as long as the button and the clock are pressed or are both high at the same time. So if you look at the output from this AND gate, we would get something maybe like this, depending on when the button was pressed. Imagine that this output, output X, now needs to be the clock signal for something else, some other piece of a system or a circuit. We would not want to send a signal like this as a clock signal with a partial pulse. Notice that this pulse and this pulse is not as long as the other ones. So we don't have a 50% duty cycle with signal X. Um, and that's because if you look at the time the button was pressed, the button was pressed in the middle of this particular clock transition, producing a high only for the second half. Same thing here, producing a high only for the first half because of when the button was pressed. So this could present a problem if this particular signal is now supposed to be the clock signal for something else. You have to have a 50% duty cycle. You need to have every transition be the same length, the same period. So the question is, how could we mitigate this? How could we take a circuit like this and modify it so that the output X has an even duty cycle for every single pulse? One method is to implement a D flip-flop. Notice that there is now a D flip-flop integrated into the circuit in between A and the input to the AND gate. So our switch is going to go into input D. Our clock will go into the clock signal of the flip-flop as well as the AND gate. And now the AND gate is going to be receiving our clock signal as well as output Q from the D flip-flop. Now we're going to figure out what signal X is going to look like with this modification. We're going to start by looking at the output for Q. So remember, this is a D flip-flop, which means Q will be whatever D is when the clock makes a negative transition. Notice the bubble in front of clock. So in this case, our input D is actually the input from the switch. So with each negative transition, like here, and here, and here, uh, the output Q is going to be whatever A is, which is our switch in this case. So here's the waveform for Q. Notice that at every negative transition, Q becomes whatever A is. At this negative transition, Q becomes A. And then at ne this negative transition over here, Q transitions to zero because A has become zero. So now that we have Q, let's look at the output of the AND gate. The output of the AND gate is going to be high whenever Q and the clock are both high. This is what the output of the AND gate will produce. Notice that every time the clock is high while Q is also high, we get a high. And now we're going to get a signal that is going to have a 50% duty cycle for these pulses. We've eliminated the partial pulses by implementing a D flip-flop into the circuit. 
And that idea is called flip-flop synchronization. How do we synchronize a signal with the clock? Now this signal is synchronized with the clock. But it's only active for a certain period of time. It's only active whenever A is active. So this signal can then be sent on to another piece of your system to control something else that should only get a clock signal whenever button A has been pressed. That's one example of flip-flop synchronization. Another thing that we can do with the flip-flop is to detect an input sequence. Meaning, we can use a D flip-flop to detect which of two signals changed first. So for example, let's say that you are in, an, in a hotel and you're going to press the button to call the elevator to come down to the first floor. Meanwhile, there's someone on the fifth floor who is also going to press a button to go up to the seventh floor. The elevator has to determine which person to respond to, the person on the first floor who pushed the button or the person on the fifth floor who pushed the button. Generally, elevators respond to whichever button was pressed first. And what if they were pressed two milliseconds apart? How do you tell which button was pressed first, the first floor or the fifth floor? One way to do that is with a D flip-flop. So... If you look at this D flip-flop here, let's assume that we're going to connect two inputs, input A and input B. Now let's assume that input A is the person on the first floor and input B is the person on the fifth floor. Each one of them are pressing a button. Let's assume that the input A is going into the D input of your D flip-flop and the second signal is going to act as a clock signal. Remember that whenever your clock signal makes a transition, in this case a positive one, Q will be whatever D is. So the person who is actually pressing the button that represents signal B may not be producing a, a clock cycle with a perfect 50% duty cycle. That's okay, but each time that person presses a button, they cause a transition from a 0 to a 1. That transition from a 0 to a 1 is all we need to trigger this flip-flop. So again, we have person, person A standing on the first floor who has pressed the button and wants to go up. We have person B standing on the fifth floor who has pressed a button and also wants to go up. Signal Q will determine who gets the elevator first based on who pressed the button first. So let's do two scenarios. In the first scenario, we're going to assume that person A on the first floor pushed the button first. If person A pushed the button first, a waveform for that might look like this. Here's person A who pressed the button first. Here's person B who pressed the button second sometime later. Remember, signal B is serving as a clock signal for your flip-flop. So whenever the second person presses the button, they're actually triggering the output of the flip-flop to change based on signal A. If this is the clock transition that controls the output of your flip-flop, that means that when person, person B presses the button, the output of the flip-flop will go high because person A pressed their button first. Signal A has already gone high. So if person A presses the button first, the output of the flip-flop will be high at some point in time. Now let's look at the opposite scenario. Let's say that person A presses their button second. Person B presses their button first. Since the person B has pressed their button first, a clock transition is gonna happen before A has changed. This transition is gonna control the output Q and at this point in time, person A has not pressed their button yet, so A is a zero. So that means your input D to your flip-flop is a zero, which means Q is a zero. So if person B pushed the button first, your signal never goes high. So you could use this signal Q as part of your elevator controller to determine what to respond to. If Q is a one, that means you need to go down to the first floor because they pressed the button first. If Q is a zero, that means you need to go to the fifth floor because they press the button first. And this is an example of how you can detect an input sequence 
or basically how you can use a flip-flop to figure out which of two signals changed first, A or B. In our next example, using flip-flops, we're going to detect a transition or an event. Um, in a synchronous circuit, meaning a circuit that's synchronized with a clock signal, we have to wait for a positive or a negative transition of the clock to see an output of a flip-flop change. But what if we wanted to detect a change in the input instantly? So let's say that we have a data input similar to a button or a switch. That button or switch can change its value at any point in time, but a flip-flop will only change its output when the clock makes a transition. What if I want to know that an input changed instantly and not have to wait for the clock signal to make a transition to know that an input has changed? That's the question. So we're going to look at this example of an edge detector circuit. Again, it's using a D flip-flop. Our input signal is like our button or our user input. We have a clock signal to control the D flip-flop. And then we have an XOR gate where the two inputs are the input signal itself and the output of our flip-flop. The XOR gate is gonna provide an output called edge. Basically, this is an edge detector circuit. What that means is that the signal edge right here will go high whenever an edge in the input signal is detected. That means this signal will go high anytime this signal goes from zero to one or one to zero, doesn't matter. It will detect an edge, positive or negative. And we'll know that that edge happened before the flip-flop can even respond to it. Because remember, I can change this input signal to high or low, but the Q output of this flip-flop won't reflect that change until the clock makes a transition. This circuit will tell me immediately, the, the, the second that in the input signal changes, this circuit will tell me immediately by making the signal edge go high. So if we draw a waveform for this circuit, you'll see how that works. Let's say that this is our input signal. And these are just different points in time, T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, and T6. So at T3, the signal goes high, and at T6, the signal goes low. Here's our clock signal going into our D flip-flop. And then we're going to look at the output Q. So at each positive edge, because the diagram is labeled showing a positive transition is what the flip-flop responds to, at each positive edge, our output Q will be whatever the input signal is. So at each positive edge, we can see that output. Notice that at this positive edge right here, the input signal is low, so Q is low. But in the middle of a transition, the input signal goes high. What if I want to know immediately that this signal has changed? The flip-flop isn't going to reflect that change until sometime later right here, because we have to wait for the next positive edge to see that the input signal is high. What if within this span of time right here, I want to know that the input signal has changed? Well, now let's take a look at the XOR gate. The XOR gate is gonna take the input signal and Q and give us an output. As long as those two values are different, we'll get a high. So if you look right here, our input signal has changed to 1. While Q has not changed, it's still 0. A 1 and a 0 going into an XOR gate will give me high. So this signal edge will go high immediately as soon as input signal changes. Signal edge will also go high. So I don't have to wait for the output here to know, hey, something has happened with my input. It's made a change or a transition. We don't know whether that input went from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0. We just know that it has changed. So if we continue going forward, once Q is the same value as the input signal, we have a 1 and a 1 going into the XOR gate, so the output will go low. But if we look forward here, the input signal once again changes before a positive transition. So we have a change right here. But because it happens before a positive transition, we're not going to see that change reflected in the Q output until the next positive transition at time 6. So within this small window of time here, if I want to know that the input signal has changed immediately, I can look at edge. Because the input signal has gone low, 
while Q is still high. So we have a low and a high going into an XOR gate, which would produce a high right here, indicating a second edge has occurred. So this is an example of an edge detector circuit, where once again, we can use a D flip-flop to determine when a signal has changed immediately, as opposed to having to wait for Q to reflect that change sometime later. Another thing that we use flip-flop for is data storage and transfer. And this is one of the most common applications of flip-flops, data storage. So if you think about the way that we store data today, uh, right now we store our data mostly in a cloud. Most of us use a cloud. Some of us might still use a USB drive. Um, before that, we had you know um, external hard drives and we had um, hard disk space on our computers and then we had DVDs and CDs that we could burn with data and before that we had floppy drives, etc. If you go all the way back to the history of being able to store data, the idea of storing data, all the pictures and the emails and the videos that we store now in a cloud somewhere, it all began with the idea of a flip-flop being able to store a zero or a one. Every piece of data that we store now essentially equates down to, you know, millions of bits. And all those bits are just zeros and ones. And the idea of being able to store data became what it is today from the idea of a flip-flop, because a flip-flop can store a zero or a one for as long as you need it. So flip-flops are uh, commonly used for data storage. We generally store groups of flip-flops together. So for example, if I want to store a single bit or a single single zero or a single one, I need one flip-flop. If I want to store eight bits, I need eight flip-flops. If I want to store a thousand bits, I need a thousand flip-flops. So when we group flip-flops together to store large groups of data, that's called a register, just a group of flip-flops. When we have registers, we can transfer data from one place to another. Um, we can move data from one place to another. So for example, when you take your USB drive and stick it into your computer to open a file, you're trying to read data from your USB drive. That's a data transfer. When you have uploaded your, updated your file and you now want to save that file back onto your USB drive, that's writing data. You're transferring data from your computer to the drive. So data transfers take place when data is moved between registers, which are essentially groups of flip-flops. We have synchronous transfers that take place with a clock signal. And then we have asynchronous transfers that take place when you control the pre and clear inputs of your flip-flop. So here's some examples of how data transfer would happen synchronously with different types of flip-flops. We have the SR flip-flop, the JK flip-flop, and the D flip-flop. Just notice that basically with each clock transition, the data that is stored in this flip-flop is transferred to this flip-flop. So the S input of this second flip-flop is connected to the output of this flip-flop. So once this flip-flop has transitioned and made its output, that output is available as an input to this flip-flop. When the clock makes a transition, that input will transfer to the output. So all three of the flip-flops that we have discussed can be used for data transfer or for storing data. When we transfer bits in groups at the same time or simultaneously, that's called a parallel transfer. So for example, we have 3D flip-flops on the left and 3D flip-flops on the right. With a single clock signal, I can take the, in the output from each one and transfer it to the next flip-flop. So when we transfer data in groups simultaneously, that's called a parallel transfer. When we transfer bits at this uh, one at a time, that's called a serial transfer. One at a time is a serial transfer. And a shift register is a group of flip-flops arranged so that the binary numbers stored in the flip-flops are shifted from one flip-flop to the next for each clock pulse. So on the screen, you'll see an example of a shift register. This is our data in, meaning this is the piece of data we want to store, and it's going to be a string of bits. So let's say that I want to store the value 1001. With each clock signal, I'll send a single bit of data into the shift register. 
with the first clock signal, the first clock transition, a one will go into here, into the first flip flop. On the next transition, that one will shift over to here and the zero will shift in here. On the third transition, the one that is in this flip flop will transfer here, the zero that was in this flop will, will transfer here, and the next piece of data will shift in. That's what a shift register is. With every clock pulse, the data that's in one register will shift forward to the next. And then a new piece of data can be shifted in to the first register for each clock pulse. If you look at this diagram, it's JK flip-flops and notice that J and K are always going to be opposites of each other. So that means you're only ever going to be setting or clearing a flip-flop. If the data in is a one, that means that J is a one and K is a zero, so the output of this flip-flop will be a one. If data in is a zero, that means J is a zero and K is a one, which means you clear the flip-flop and the output here will be a zero. So the way that this is wired, you're only ever going to have these flip-flops in a set or reset mode. Never toggle, never no change. So now we're going to complete a timing diagram for this shift register. And the shift pulses signal can be thought of as a clock signal. So if you look at down here, it says shift pulses. That's a clock signal. So we're going to look at four clock transitions. Here's the data being supplied with each transition, and we're gonna look at how each flip-flop is gonna respond. So we're gonna begin with this one here, X3. Remember that J and K are wired so that whenever the input data is a one, J will be a one, K will be a zero, and output three will be a one. Whenever data in is a zero, the output of this flip-flop will be a zero. So if we look at X3, with each clock transition, with this transition, we have a one going in. So X3 will become a one after that transition. With this transition, we have a zero going in. So X3 will be a zero after that transition. We have a one going in. So X3 will be a one. And we have a one going in here and X3 will stay a one. So at this point, we've shifted one, zero, one, one through this register. Now let's look at X2. X2 gets the outputs from X3. So X2, X1, X0, they're all gonna behave the same way. If their input is a one, their output will be a one. If their input is a zero, their output will be a zero. So if we look at X2, on the first clock transition, X2 is going to get the output from X3, right here. X3 is a zero, so X2 will be a zero. On this clock transition right here. So on the next transition, X3 was a one, and then that one will shift forward right there. On this clock transition, the zero that came before will shift forward right there. And this one will shift forward right here. So with each transition, the piece of data that was stored in the flip-flop before now gets shifted forward to the next flip-flop. And this is a shift right register. You can also have a shift left register where the data travels in the opposite direction. So <clears throat> if we look at X1, the zero that was stored right here shifts forward to here with this clock transition. This zero goes here with this clock transition. This one goes here on this clock transition and so forth. And then we have X zero, which follows the same pattern. That's how a shift register works. And that's what a waveform would look like for a shift register where you can see that data is shifting forward or to the right with each clock pulse. Next, we have something called a recirculating shift register. That's a shift register that keeps information circulating through. So for example, you load one specific value and it cir circulates that specific value over and over through the register. There's no new data that comes in from a user. You would use the pre and the clear inputs to initially give your, your register a value, and then it'll circulate that value through the register. You will study these in Digital Systems 2 if you take that course.
where you'll learn about Johnson and ring counters, which are recirculating shift registers. So with each clock pulse, the data just continues to shift in a circle. So if this had the value 0, 0, 1, 1, with each clock pulse, this one just gets fed right back around to the front and everything else shifts forward. So we're going to build a table showing what will happen for eight clock pulses with a recirculating register. We're going to assume the initial value in the register is 1011. 1011. So with the first clock pulse, we can see that x0 is going to become an input to x3. I mean to the flip-flop that has an output of x3. So with the first clock pulse, this one and right back around to the front and this one moved over here this one moved over here and this one moved over here that's what a recirculating shift register does so if we look at the next clock pulse the same thing occurs where this one gets sent around to the front everything shifts over so if you continue this for eight clock pulses you can see how everything recirculates it's a recirculating shift register where the same four bits are just juggled around in succession with each clock pulse. So now that we know a little bit about registers and how they might work, we're going to do some troubleshooting. So the figure below shows a three-bit shift register made up of flip-flops. These are TTL flip-flops, which respond to an open input as if it were a logic high. So in the past, if you have ever wondered why your circuit might have worked, for example, I've had a student wire an OR gate, but they only supplied one input to the OR gate. And they wanted to know why the output was always high, even though one input was never connected to anything. Well, the chips that we use in our labs are TTL flip-flops, which means if you don't connect an input to anything, it assumes that input is high. So with an OR gate or an AND gate, when you only wire one input and you leave another one open, that second input will always be perceived to be high. That's what that means. Um, so initially, all of the flip-flops are in the low state before a clock pulse is applied here in this example. And we're going to determine the expected output for X2, X1, and X0 for eight clock pulses. So notice that I have a shift register. Data is going to shift from one flip-flop to the next in this direction. What is J2 connected to? This is just a pull-up resistor. So that just controls the amount of current that flows into J2. And we have it connected to 5 volts. So that means that J2 is essentially always connected to a high or a 1. With every clock pulse, a 1 is going to shift into J2. So let's take a look at what the truth table would look like for this shift register. Again, we're going to assume before the clock makes its first transition, all of the registers have zeros in them. With the first clock pulse, J2 is going to get a 1. With the second clock pulse, J2 will still get a 1, and what was in J2 has shifted into J1. With the third clock pulse, J2 will get another 1. J1 gets the 1 from J2 and J0 gets the one from J1. At this point, all we're doing is shifting in more ones and nothing's really going to change. The output is gonna look like this continuously. That is how this particular circuit is supposed to work. And we need this information because, let's say that the truth table on this picture is what you actually got as an output. So you built the circuit, you're testing it, you do eight clock pulses, and this is the output you actually get. Question is, what's the problem? And how could this problem have been produced? And maybe what can we do to fix it? So if we look at the output here, this output follows what we had before up until this point. We can see that the one continues to shift into J2 because it always has a one. That one shifts into J1 because this always has a one. But the last flip-flop has some zeros in there. 
If you look closely, the last flip-flop seems to be toggling between zeros and ones. Zeros and ones. So if you were to troubleshoot this, you'd have to start asking yourself, why is the last flip-flop toggling? And what would have to happen to cause the last flip-flop to be stuck in toggle mode? So if we look at X1, X1 is basically from this point forward. This is where the problem seems to occur. Um, X1 is always a one. So in order to force this flip-flop to toggle, what does this input have to be? It would also have to be a one. So we know that logically, if this output is a one, this output right here has to be a zero because that's how this flip-flop works. So it has to be a zero, but what's being sent or perceived right here is a one. So there's a couple of things you could come up with as an issue. Perhaps this output isn't working correctly. Something's happening with this output. Or perhaps this connection is broken because remember we said that these are TTL devices and if a connection is open, it's perceived to always be a one. If this wire is broken, that means this input is always one. And once this input becomes one, we force this into toggle mode. So as we troubleshoot, these are the types of things that we might think about. In a nutshell, has, here's the example from the text, or I'm sorry, the solution from the text, where we can see it says that X0 is changing states, toggling on all pulses after the second one. This toggle operation would occur if J and K were both high. The most probable fault is a break in the connection between not X1 and K0. Because if this were broken, then this would always receive a 1. And once X1 becomes a 1, the flip-flop goes into toggle mode. The last thing we're going to discuss in this video is the definition of a Schmidt trigger device and a one-shot device. For the purposes of this class, you just need to know what this definition. If you take Digital Systems 2, you will see this in one of the lab experiments in that class. So this is just a quick introduction so that when you get to that class and you get to that lab, you've at least seen what a Schmidt trigger device is. Um, so let's say that we have an inverter. Just as an example, we have an inverter and we're trying to invert a signal. But the signal looks something like this. We would call this a very noisy signal. It's got a lot of oscillations. It um, has a slow transition from a zero to a one. And uh, we would just call this a very a noisy signal. And a standard inverter would have a hard time being able to invert a signal like this. So if we were to send a signal like this into an inverter, this is what we would get out. Notice right here, we've got some oscillations between the one and the zero. And we've got some oscillations again between the zero and the one. Those oscillations also make for a very noisy, messy signal. If we were trying to send this signal to something else, this would really interfere with our circuit. So a Schmidt trigger device is a device that is able to accept a noisy, slow changing signal like this one and give an output that has oscillation free transitions. This is the symbol for a Schmidt trigger device. So it looks like an inverter, but it has a symbol in the middle. And it is meant to take a signal like this that is just inherently noisy and slow changing and give us an output that more accurately represents an inverter or the output of an inverter. And it more accurately gives a signal that can be used for another piece or another component of your circuit without all of these oscillations. That's what a Schmidt trigger device is. And again, for the purpose of this class, you simply need to know the definition just so that you have heard it before, so that as you go on, it's not something new and you at least have an idea of what it does. The other device that you'll see in Digital 2 that we're just going to give you a quick introduction to is a one-shot device. It's similar to a flip-flop. It has two outputs, Q and Q0. It has a stable output state. Normally, that Q is 0 and not Q is 1. So it, its normal state is that its output is low. With a one-shot device, you trigger the output to become inverted. When you trigger it, the output becomes a one. 
The difference between this and a flip-flop is that the output becomes a one only for a fixed amount of time, and then it will automatically go back low once the time period ends. It doesn't just stay high forever like a D flip-flop might or a JK flip-flop. So that's the, the difference between uh, flip-flops and a one-shot. You can trigger it to go high for a specific amount of time, and that's it. You have two types of one-shots. They can be non-retriggerable, meaning that if you send a new trigger while the current output is already high, nothing happens. It, will, it won't make it stay high any longer. Or you have retriggerable, which in that case, a new trigger will reset the clock for an output pulse. And I'll show you an example of what those look like. So here's our symbol for a one-shot. You send in a trigger, which means you send in a pulse, a zero to a one or a one to a zero, depending on how this is labeled. This is labeled to respond to a positive trigger. You have to connect the one shot to a resistor and a capacitor. This controls your time that the one shot will be high once triggered, so you can manipulate how long it will stay high. And then let's say that this is your, your trigger. Anytime the trigger makes a positive transition, the output will be high for a fixed period of time. Again, that period of time is dependent on the resistance and capacitance you pick here. Once that time is up, it goes back low. That's it. It only goes high for a specific amount of time. So even if the trigger is longer, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the transition. The transition of the trigger forces Q to respond for a specific amount of time, and then it goes back low. And if I try to re-trigger, while the output is already high, nothing happens if you have a non-retriggerable one-shot. But let's say that you did have a retriggerable one-shot. If you look right here, here's my trigger signaling the output to go high. This is non-retriggerable. This is retriggerable. And then let's say that I trigger and trigger again before it's gone back low. If it's a non-retriggerable one-shot, the second trigger means nothing. If it is retriggerable, the second trigger resets the clock so that your trigger basically starts over right here. So you'll have a longer output of uh, being high here. That's what a one-shot device does. And quick example, we're going to draw a waveform for this circuit below where you have three non-retriggerable one-shots connected in a chain. Notice that these ones respond to negative transitions because you have a bubble in front of the T. So we're going to have an initial pulse of 10 milliseconds. So this pulse right here is 10 milliseconds, and we're going to draw a diagram showing what's going to happen. So keep in mind, again, this responds to a negative transition. So the 10 milliseconds is going to go high and then low. It's that low transition right there that's going to trigger the first one shot. And it's going to have a time of 5 milliseconds. It's going to be high for 5 milliseconds. When this one shot's output goes low, it'll trigger the next one and so forth. So we can see that Q1 will be high for 5 milliseconds once it's triggered. And it's that low, high to low transition, because of the bubble right here, that triggers the next one shot. It will be high for 20 milliseconds. When that signal goes low, the next one shot will be triggered and it will go high for 10 milliseconds. That's how a one shot operates. So um, basically this is the end of the lecture and this is the end of the lecture series for the course. Keep in mind for the final exam, you should be able to understand some of the flip-flop applications that we've done in this video. You should also maybe be able to just uh, define the Schmidt trigger and one-shot devices, be able to provide simple definitions for those, um, and you will see those again in Digital 2. So this is just sort of a preview of one of the labs that you will do where you need to use those devices. So now you have an idea of what they are. As always, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, please shoot me an email and I will be happy to help walk you through any of the problems uh, in this video. And um, that's it. That's the end of this video.